iBridge Audio presents Beowulf, translated and read by Seamus Heaney. So, the Spear Danes in days gone by, and the kings who ruled them had courage and greatness. We have heard of those princes' heroic campaigns. There was Shield Sheafson, scourge of many tribes, a wrecker of mead benches, rampaging among foes. This terror of the hall troops had come far. A foundling to start with, he would flourish later on as his powers waxed and his worth was proved. In the end, each clan on the outlying coasts beyond the Whale Road had to yield to him and begin to pay tribute. That was one good king. Afterwards, a boy child was born to Shield, a cub in the yard, a comfort sent by God to that nation. He knew what they had thold, the long times and troubles they'd come through without a leader. So the Lord of Life, the glorious Almighty, made this man renowned. Shield had fathered a famous son. Beo's name was known through the north. And a young prince must be prudent like that, giving freely while his father lives, so that afterwards in age, when fighting starts, steadfast companions will stand by him and hold the line. Behaviour that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. Shield was still thriving when his time came and he crossed over into the Lord's keeping. His warrior band did what he bade them when he laid down the law among the Danes. They shouldered him out to the sea's flood, the chief they revered who had long ruled them. A ring-whirled prow rode in the harbour, ice-clad, outbound, a craft for a prince. They stretched their beloved Lord in his boat, laid out by the mast amidships the great ring-giver. Far-fetched treasures were piled upon him and precious gear. I never heard before of a ship so well furbished with battle-tackle, bladed weapons and coats of mail. The mast treasure was loaded on top of him. It would travel far, on out into the ocean's sway. They decked his body no less bountifully with offerings than those first ones did, who cast him away when he was a child and launched him alone out over the waves. And they set a gold standard up high above his head and let him drift to wind and tide, bewailing him and mourning their loss. No man can tell. No wise man in hall or weathered veteran knows for certain who salvaged that load. Then it fell to Beo to keep the forts. He was well regarded and ruled the Danes for a long time after his father took leave of his life on earth. And then his heir, the great half-Dane, held sway for as long as he lived, their elder and warlord. He was four times a father, this fighter prince. One by one they entered the world, Herogar, Hrothgar, the good Halga, and a daughter, I have heard, who was Onala's queen, a balm in bed for the battle-scarred Swede. The fortunes of war favoured Hrothgar. Friends and kinsmen flocked to his ranks, young followers, a force that grew to be a mighty army. So his mind turned to hall-building. He handed down orders for men to work on a great mead hall, meant to be a wonder of the world for ever. It would be his throne room, and there he would dispense his God-given goods to young and old, but not the common land or people's lives. Far and wide through the world, I have heard, orders for work to adorn that wallstead were sent to many peoples, and soon it stood there, finished and ready, in full view, the Hall of Halls. Herod was the name he had settled on it, whose utterance was law. Nor did he renege, but doled out rings and torques at the table. The hall towered, its gables wide and high, and awaiting a barbarous burning. 
that doom abided. But in time it would come. The killer instinct unleashed among in-laws, the bloodlust rampant. Then a powerful demon, a prowler through the dark, nursed a hard grievance. It harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet every day in the hall, the harp being struck and the clear song of a skilled poet telling with mastery of man's beginnings how the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girdled with waters. In his splendour he set the sun and the moon to be earth's lamplight, lanterns for men, and filled the broad lap of the world with branches and leaves and quickened life in every other thing that moved. So times were pleasant for the people there, until finally one, a fiend out of hell, began to work his evil in the world. Grendel was the name of this grim demon, haunting the marches, marauding round the heath and the desolate fens. He had dwelt for a time in misery among the banished monsters, Cain's clan, whom the Creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts. For the killing of Abel, the Eternal Lord had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder, because the Almighty made him anathema, and out of the curse of his exile there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms, and giants too, who strove with God time and again until he gave them their reward. So, after nightfall, Grendel set out for the lofty house to see how the ring Danes were settling into it after their drink. And there he came upon them, a company of the best, asleep from their feasting, insensible to pain and human sorrow. Suddenly then the God-cursed brute was creating havoc. Greedy and grim, he grabbed thirty men from their resting places and rushed to his lair, flushed up and inflamed from the raid, blundering back with the butchered corpses. Then, as dawn brightened and the day broke, Grendel's powers of destruction were plain. Their wassail was over. They wept to heaven and mourned under mourning. Their mighty prince, the story leader, sat stricken and helpless, humiliated by the loss of his guard, bewildered and stunned, staring aghast at the demon's trail in deep distress. He was numb with grief, but got no respite, for one night later merciless Grendel struck again with more gruesome murders. Malignant by nature, he never showed remorse. It was easy then to meet with a man shifting himself to a safer distance to bed in the bothies. For who could be blind to the evidence of his eyes, the obviousness of the hall watcher's hate? Whoever escaped kept a weather eye open and moved away. So Grendel ruled in defiance of right, one against all, until the greatest house in the world stood empty, a deserted wallstead. For twelve winters, seasons of woe, the Lord of the Shieldings suffered under his load of sorrow. And so, before long, the news was known over the whole world. Sad lays were sung about the beset king, the vicious raids and ravages of Grendel, his long and unrelenting feud, nothing but war, how he would never parley or make peace with any Dane, nor stop his death-dealing, nor pay the death price. No counsellor could ever expect fair reparation from those rabid hands. All were endangered. Young and old were hunted down by that dark death-shadow who lurked and swooped in the long nights on the misty moors. Nobody knows where these reavers from hell roam on their errands. So Grendel waged his lonely war, inflicting constant cruelties on the people, atrocious hurt. He took over Herod, haunted the glittering hall after dark. But the throne itself, the treasure seat, he was kept from approaching. He was the Lord's outcast. These were hard times, heartbreaking for the Prince of the Shieldings. Powerful counsellors, the highest in the land, would lend advice, 
plotting how best the bull defenders might resist and beat off sudden attacks. Sometimes at pagan shrines they vowed offerings to idols, swore oaths that the killer of souls would come to their aid and save the people. That was their way, their heathenish hope. Deep in their hearts they remembered hell. The almighty judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, head of the heavens and high king of the world, was unknown to them. O oh, cursed is he who in time of trouble has to thrust his soul in the fire's embrace, forfeiting help. He has nowhere to turn. But blessed is he who after death can approach the Lord and find friendship in the Father's embrace. So that troubled time continued, woe that never stopped, steady affliction for half Dane's son, too hard an ordeal. There was panic after dark. People endured raids in the night, riven by the terror. When he heard about Grendel, Hyalax Thane was on home ground over in Geatland. There was no one else like him alive. In his day, he was the mightiest man on earth, high-born and powerful. He ordered a boat that would ply the waves. He announced his plan to sail the Swan's Road and search out that king, the famous prince who needed defenders. Nobody tried to keep him from going. No elder denied him, dear as he was to them. Instead, they inspected omens and spurred his ambition to go, whilst he moved about like the leader he was, enlisting men, the best he could find. With fourteen others, the warrior boarded the boat as captain a canny pilot along coast and currents. Time went by. The boat was on water, in close under the cliffs. Men climbed eagerly up the gangplank. Sand churned in surf. Warriors loaded a cargo of weapons, shining war gear in the vessel's hold, then heaved out, away with a will in their wood-wreathed ship. Over the waves, with the wind behind her and foam at her neck, she flew like a bird until her curved prow had covered the distance. And on the following day, at the due hour, those seafarers sighted land, sunlit cliffs, sheer crags and looming headlands, the landfall they sought. It was the end of their voyage, and the Geats vaulted over the side, out onto the sand, and moored their ship. There was a clash of mail and a thresh of gear. They thanked God for that easy crossing on a calm sea. When the watchman on the wall, the shielding's lookout, whose job it was to guard the sea cliffs, saw shields glittering on the gangplank and battle equipment being unloaded, he had to find out who and what the arrivals were. So he rode to the shore, this horseman of Hrothgar's, and challenged them in formal terms, flourishing his spear. What kind of men are you who arrive, rigged out for combat in coats of mail, sailing here over the sea lanes in your steep-hulled boat? I have been stationed as lookout on this coast for a long time. My job is to watch the waves for raiders, any danger to the Danish shore. Never before has a force under arms disembarked so openly, not bothering to ask if the sentries allowed them safe passage or the clan had consented. Nor have I seen a mightier man at arms on this earth than the one standing here. Unless I am mistaken, he is truly noble. This is no mere hanger-on in a hero's armour. So now... Before you fare inland as interlopers, I have to be informed about who you are and where you hail from. Outsiders from across the water, I say it again. The sooner you tell where you come from and why, the better. The leader of the troop unlocked his word hoard. The distinguished one delivered this answer. We belong by birth to the Geat people and owe allegiance to Lord Hialak. 
In his day, my father was a famous man, a noble warrior lord named Edgethil. He outlasted many a long winter and went on his way. All over the world, men wise in counsel continue to remember him. We come in good faith to find your lord and nation's shield, the son of Halfdane. Give us the right advice and direction. We have arrived here on a great errand to the Lord of the Danes, and I believe, therefore, there should be nothing hidden or withheld between us. So tell us if what we have heard is true about this threat, whatever it is, this danger abroad in the dark nights, this corpse-maker mongering death in the shielding country. I come to proffer my wholehearted help and counsel. I can show the wise Hrothgar a way to defeat his enemy and find respite, if any respite is to reach him ever. I can calm the turmoil and terror in his mind. Otherwise, he must endure woes and live with grief for as long as his hall stands at the horizon on its high ground. Undaunted, sitting astride his horse, the coast guard answered, Anyone with gumption and a sharp mind will take the measure of two things, what's said and what's done. I believe what you have told me, that you are a troop loyal to our king. So come ahead with your arms and your gear, and I will guide you. What's more, I'll order my own comrades on their word of honour to watch your boat down there on the strand, keep her safe in her fresh tar, until the time comes for her curved prow to preen on the waves and bear this hero back to Geatland. May one so valiant and so venturesome come unharmed through the clash of battle. So they went on their way. The ship rode the water, broad-beamed, bound by its hawser and anchored fast. Boar shapes flashed above their cheek guards, the brightly forged work of goldsmiths watching over those stern-faced men. They marched in step, hurrying on till the timbered hall rose before them, radiant with gold. Nobody on earth knew of another building like it. Majesty lodged there. Its light shone over many lands. So their gallant escort guided them to that dazzling stronghold and indicated the shortest way to it. Then the noble warrior wheeled on his horse and spoke these words. It is time for me to go. May the Almighty Father keep you and in his kindness watch over your exploits. I'm away to the sea, back on alert against enemy raiders. It was a paved track, a path that kept them in marching order. Their mail shirts glinted, hard and hand-linked. The high-gloss iron of their armour rang. So they duly arrived in their grim war graith and gear at the hall, and weary from the sea, stacked wide shields of the toughest hardwood against the wall, then collapsed on the benches. Battle dress and weapons clashed. They collected their spears in a seafarer's stook, a stand of greyish tapering ash, and the troops themselves were as good as their weapons. Then a proud warrior questioned the men concerning their origins. Where do you come from, carrying these decorated shields and shirts of mail, these cheek-hinged helmets and javelins? I am Hrothgar's herald and officer. I have never seen so impressive or large an assembly of strangers. Stoutness of heart, bravery, not banishment, must have brought you to Hrothgar. The man whose name was known for courage, the Geat leader, resolute in his helmet, answered in return. We are retainers from Hialak's band. Beowulf is my name. If your lord and master, the most renowned son of Halfdane, will hear me out and graciously allow me to greet him in person, I am ready and willing to report my errand. Wolfgar replied, 
a Wendell chief, renowned as a warrior, well known for his wisdom and the temper of his mind. I will take this message in accordance with your wish to our noble king. With that, he turned to where Hrothgar sat. Wolfgar addressed his dear lord. People from Geatland have put ashore. They have sailed far over the wide sea. They call the chief in charge of their band by the name of Beowulf. They beg, my lord, an audience with you, exchange of words and formal greeting. Most gracious Hrothgar, do not refuse them, but grant them a reply. From their arms and appointment they appear well born and worthy of respect, especially the one who has led them this far. He is formidable indeed. Hrothgar, protector of shieldings, replied, I used to know him when he was a young boy. His father before him was called Edgethil. A crew of seamen who sailed for me once with a gift cargo across to Geatland returned with marvellous tales about him. A thane, they declared, with the strength of thirty in the grip of each hand. Now holy God has in his goodness guided him here to the West Danes, to defend us from Grendel. This is my hope, and for his heroism I will recompense him with a rich treasure. Go immediately, bid him and the Geats he has in attendance to assemble and enter. At the door of the hall, Wolfgar duly delivered the message. My lord, the conquering king of the Danes, bids me announce that he knows your ancestry. Also that he welcomes you here to Herod and salutes your arrival from across the sea. You are free now to move forward to meet Hrothgar in helmets and armour. The hero arose, surrounded closely by his powerful thanes. A party remained under orders to keep watch on the arms. The rest proceeded, led by their prince under Herod's roof. And standing on the hearth, in webbed links that the smith had woven, the fine forged mesh of his gleaming mail shirt, resolute in his helmet, Beowulf spoke. Greetings to Hrothgar. I am Haelak's kinsman, one of his hall troop. When I was younger, I had great triumphs. Then news of Grendel, hard to ignore, reached me at home. Sailors brought stories of the plight you suffer in this legendary hall, how it lies deserted, empty and useless, once the evening light hides itself under heaven's dome. So every elder and experienced councilman among my people supported my resolve to come here to you, King Hrothgar, because all knew of my awesome strength. And so my request... O King of Bright Danes, dear Prince of the Shieldings, friend of the people and their ring of defence, my one request is that you won't refuse me, who have come this far, the privilege of purifying Herod, with my own men to help me, and nobody else. I have heard, moreover, that the monster scorns in his reckless way the use of weapons. Therefore, to heighten Hyalak's fame and gladden his heart, I hereby renounce sword and the shelter of the broad shield, the heavy war board. Hand to hand is how it will be, a life and death fight with the fiend. Whichever one death fells must deem it a just judgment by God. Fate goes ever as fate must. Hrothgar the helmet of shieldings, spoke. Beowulf, my friend, you have travelled here to favour us with help and to fight for us. My household guard are on the wane. Fate sweeps them away into Grendel's clutches. But God can easily halt these raids and harrowing attacks. Now take your place at the table, Relish the triumph of heroes to your heart's content. 
Then a bench was cleared in that banquet hall, so the geats could have room to be together, and the party sat, proud in their bearing, strong and stalwart. An attendant stood by with a decorated pitcher, pouring bright helpings of mead. And the minstrel sang, filling Herod with his head-clearing voice, gladdening that great rally of Geats and Danes. Then the grey-haired treasure-giver was glad. Far-famed in battle, the prince of bright Danes and keeper of his people counted on Beowulf, on the warrior's steadfastness and his word. So the laughter started, the din got louder, and the crowd was happy. Wealthio came in, Hrothgar's queen, observing the courtesies. Adorned in her gold, she graciously saluted the men in hall, then handed the cup to all ranks, treating the household and the assembled troop, until it was Beowulf's turn to take it from her hand. With measured words she welcomed the Geat and thanked God for granting her wish that a deliverer she could believe in would arrive to ease their afflictions. He accepted the cup, a daunting man, dangerous in action and eager for it always. He addressed Wealthio. Beowulf, the son of Edgtheo, declared, I had a fixed purpose when I put to sea. As I sat in the boat with my band of men, I meant to perform to the uttermost what your people wanted, or perish in the attempt, in the fiend's clutches. And I shall fulfil that purpose, prove myself with a proud deed, or meet my death here in the Mead Hall. This formal boast by Beowulf the Geat pleased the lady well, and she went to sit by Hrothgar, real and arrayed with gold. Then it was like old times in the echoing hall, proud talk and the people happy, loud and excited, until soon enough Halfdane's heir had to be away to his night's rest. He realised that the demon was going to descend on the hall, that he had plotted all day from dawn light until darkness gathered again over the world and stealthy night shapes came stealing forth under the cloud murk. The company stood as the two leaders took leave of each other. Hrothgar wished Beowulf health and good luck, named him Hall Warden, and announced as follows. Never, since my hand could hold a shield, have I entrusted or given control of the Danes' hall to anyone but you. Ward and guard it, for it is the greatest of houses. Be on your mettle now. Keep in mind your fame. Beware of the enemy. There's nothing you wish for that won't be yours if you win through alive. Hrothgar departed then with his houseguard. The Lord of the Shieldings, their shelter in war, left the Mead Hall to lie with Welthel, his queen and his bedmate. The King of Heaven, as people learned, had posted a lookout who was a match for Grendel, a guard against monsters, special protection to the Danish prince. The Geat placed complete trust in his strength of limb and the Lord's favour. He began to remove his iron breast mail, took off the helmet and handed his attendant the pattern sword, a smith's masterpiece, ordering him to keep the equipment guarded. And before he bedded down, Beowulf, that prince of goodness, proudly asserted, When it comes to fighting, I count myself as dangerous any day as Grendel, so it won't be a cutting edge I'll wield to mow him down, easily as I might. He has no idea of the arts of war, of shield or sword play, although he does possess a wild strength. No weapons, therefore, for either this night. Unarmed he shall face me, if face me he dares. And may the Divine Lord in his wisdom grant the glory of victory to whichever side he sees fit. 
Then down the brave man lay, with his bolster under his head, and his whole company of sea rovers at rest beside him. None of them expected he would ever see his homeland again, or get back to his native place and the people who reared him. They knew too well the way it was before, how often the Danes had fallen prey to death in the Mead Hall. But the Lord was weaving a victory on his war loom for the weather geats. Through the strength of one, they all prevailed. They would crush their enemy and come through in triumph and gladness. The truth is clear. Almighty God rules over mankind and always has. Then out of the night came the shadow stalker, stealthy and swift. The hall guards were slack, asleep at their posts, all except one. It was widely understood that as long as the Lord forbade it, the fiend could never bear them beyond his shadow born. One man, however, was in fighting mood, awake and on edge, spoiling for action. In off the moors, down through the mist bands, God-cursed Grendel came greedily loping. The bane of the race of men roamed forth, hunting for a prey in the high hall. Under the cloud murk he moved towards it until it shone above him, a sheer keep of fortified gold. Nor was that the first time he had scouted the grounds of Hrothgar's dwelling, although never in his life, before or since, did he find harder fortune or hall defenders. Spurned and joyless, he journeyed on ahead and arrived at the bawn. The iron-braced door turned on its hinge when his hands touched it. Then his rage boiled over. He ripped open the mouth of the building, maddening for blood, pacing the length of the pattern floor with his loathsome tread, while a baleful light, flame more than light, flared from his eyes. He saw many men in the mansion, sleeping, a ranked company of kinsmen and warriors quartered together, and his glee was demonic, picturing the mayhem. Before morning he would rip life from limb and devour them, feed on their flesh, but his fate that night was due to change. His days of ravening had come to an end. Mighty and canny, Hayalak's kinsman was keenly watching for the first move the monster would make. Nor did the creature keep him waiting, but struck suddenly and started in. He grabbed and mauled a man on his bench, bit into his bone lappings, bolted down his blood and gorged on him in lumps, leaving the body utterly lifeless eaten up hand and foot. Venturing closer, his talon was raised to attack Beowulf where he lay on the bed. He was bearing in with open claw when the alert hero's comeback and arm lock forestalled him utterly. The captain of evil discovered himself in a hand grip harder than anything he had ever encountered in any man on the face of the earth. Every bone in his body quailed and recoiled, but he could not escape. He was desperate to flee to his den and hide with the devil's litter, for in all his days he had never been clamped or cornered like this. Then Hialek's trusty retainer recalled his bedtime speech, sprang to his feet and got a firm hold. Fingers were bursting, the monster backtracking, the man overpowering. The dread of the land was desperate to escape, to take a roundabout road and flee to his lair in the fens. The latching power in his fingers weakened. It was the worst trip the terror monger had taken to Herod. And now the timbers trembled and sang, a hall session that harrowed every Dane inside the stockade. Stumbling in fury, the two contenders crashed through the building. The hall clattered and hammered, but somehow survived the onslaught and kept standing. It was handsomely structured, a sturdy frame, braced with the best of blacksmith's work inside and out. The story goes that as the pair struggled, mead benches were smashed and sprung off the floor, gold fittings and all. 
Before then, no shielding elder would believe there was any power or person upon earth capable of wrecking their horn-rigged hull, unless the burning embrace of a fire engulf it in flame. Then an extraordinary wail arose, and bewildering fear came over the Danes. Everyone felt it who heard that cry as it echoed off the wall, a God-cursed scream and strain of catastrophe, the howl of the loser, the lament of the hell surf keening his wound. He was overwhelmed, manacled tight, by the man who of all men was foremost and strongest in the days of this life. But the Earl Troop's leader was not inclined to allow his caller to depart alive. He did not consider that life of much account to anyone anywhere. Time and again, Beowulf's warriors worked to defend their lord's life, laying about them as best they could with ancestral blades. Stalwart in action, they kept striking out on every side, seeking to cut straight to the soul. When they joined the struggle, there was something they could not have known at the time, that no blade on earth, no blacksmith's art, could ever damage their demon opponent. He had conjured the harm from the cutting edge of every weapon. But his going away out of this world and the days of his life would be agony to him, and his alien spirit would travel far into the fiend's keeping. Then he who had harrowed the hearts of men with pain and affliction in former times, and given offence also to God, found that his bodily powers failed him. Helex's kinsman kept him helplessly locked in a hand grip. As long as either lived, he was hateful to the other. The monster's whole body was in pain. A tremendous wound appeared on his shoulder. Sinews split and bone lappings burst. Beowulf was granted the glory of winning. Grendel was driven under the fen banks, fatally hurt to his desolate lair. His days were numbered. The end of his life was coming over him. He knew it for certain. And one bloody clash had fulfilled the dearest wishes of the Danes. The man who had lately landed among them, proud and sure, had purged the hall, kept it from harm. He was happy with his night work and the courage he had shown. The Geat captain had boldly fulfilled his boast to the Danes. He had healed and relieved a huge distress, unremitting humiliations, the hard fate they'd been forced to undergo, no small affliction. Clear proof of this could be seen in the hand the hero displayed high up near the roof, the whole of Grendel's shoulder and arm, his awesome grasp. Then morning came, and many a warrior gathered, as I've heard, around the gift hall, Clan chiefs flocking from far and near down wide-ranging roads, wondering greatly at the monster's footprints. His fatal departure was regretted by no one who witnessed his trail, the ignominious marks of his flight where he'd skulked away, exhausted in spirit and beaten in battle, bloodying the path, hauling his doom to the demon's mere. The bloodshot water wallowed and surged, there were loathsome upthrows and overturnings of waves and gore and wound slurry. With his death upon him, he had dived deep into his marsh den, drowned out his life and his heathen soul. Hell claimed him there. Then away they rode, the old retainers, with many a young man following after, a troop on horseback, in high spirits on their bay steeds. Beowulf's doings were praised over and over again. Nowhere, they said, north or south, between the two seas or under the tall sky, on the broad earth, was there anyone better to raise a shield or to rule a kingdom. Yet there was no laying of blame on their lord, the noble Hrothgar. He was a good king. 
At times the war band broke into a gallop, letting their chestnut horses race wherever they found the going good on those well-known tracks. Meanwhile, a thane of the king's household, a carrier of tales, a traditional singer deeply schooled in the lore of the past, linked a new theme to a strict metre. The man started to recite with skill, rehearsing Beowulf's triumphs and feats in well-fashioned lines, entwining his words. The light of day broke and kept brightening. Bands of retainers galloped in excitement to the gabled hall to see the marvel. And the king himself, guardian of the ring hoard, goodness in person, walked in majesty from the women's quarters with a numerous train, attended by his queen and her crowd of maidens, across to the mead hall. When Hrothgar arrived at the hall, he spoke, standing on the steps under the steep eaves, gazing at the roofwork and Grendel's talon. First and foremost, let the Almighty Father be thanked for this sight. I suffered a long harrowing by Grendel, but the heavenly shepherd can work his wonders always and everywhere. Not long since, it seemed I would never be granted the slightest solace or relief from any of my burdens. The best of houses glittered and reeked and ran with blood. This one worry outweighed all others, a constant distress to counsellors entrusted with defending the people's forts from assault by monsters and demons. But now a man with the Lord's assistance has accomplished something none of us could manage before now for all our efforts. Whoever she was who brought forth this flower of manhood, if she is still alive, that woman can say that in her labours the Lord of Ages bestowed a grace on her. So now, Beowulf, I adopt you in my heart as a dear son. Nourish and maintain this new connection, you noblest of men. There'll be nothing you'll want for, no worldly goods that won't be yours. I have often honoured smaller achievements, Recognised warriors not nearly as worthy, lavished rewards on the less deserving. But you have made yourself immortal by your glorious action. May the God of Ages continue to keep and requite you well. Then half Dane's son presented Beowulf with a gold standard as a victory gift, an embroidered banner, also breast mail and a helmet and a sword carried high that was both precious object and token of honour. So Beowulf drank his drink at ease. It was hardly a shame to be showered with such gifts in front of the hall troops. There haven't been many moments, I am sure, when men exchanged four such treasures at so friendly a sitting. An embossed ridge, a band lapped with wire, arched over the helmet, head protection to keep the keen-honed cutting edge from damaging it when danger threatened and the man was battling behind his shield. Next the king ordered eight horses with gold bridles to be brought through the yard into the hall. The harness of one included a saddle of sumptuous design, the battle seat where the son of Halfdane rode when he wished to join the sword play. Wherever the killing and carnage were the worst, he would be to the fore, fighting hard. Then the Danish prince, descendant of Ing, handed over both the arms and the horses, urging Beowulf to use them well. And so their leader, the lord and guard of coffer and strong room, with customary grace, bestowed upon Beowulf both sets of gifts. A fair witness can see how well each one behaved. The chieftain went on to reward the others. Each man on the bench who had sailed with Beowulf and risked the voyage received a bounty, some treasured possession. And compensation, a price in gold, was settled for the geat Grendel had cruelly killed earlier, as he would have killed more 
had not mindful God and one man's daring prevented that doom. Past and present, God's will prevails. Hence, understanding is always best and a prudent mind. Whoever remains for long here in this earthly life will enjoy and endure more than enough. They sang then and played to please the hero, words and music for their warrior prince, harp tunes and tales of adventure. There were high times on the hall benches, and the king's poet performed his part with the saga of Finn and his sons, unfolding the tale of that fierce attack in Friesland, when Hnaf, king of the Danes, met death, and his sister Hildebur suffered cruelly. Son and brother, she lost them both on the battlefield. They foredoomed, cut down and spear-gored. She in shock, waylaid by grief, Hawk's daughter. How could she not lament her fate when morning came and the light broke on her murdered dears? And so farewell, delight on earth. War carried away Finn's troop of thanes, all but a few. How then could Finn hold the line or fight on to the end with Hengest? How save the rump of his force from that enemy chief? So a truce was offered as follows. First, separate quarters to be cleared for the Danes, hall and throne to be shared with the Frisians. Then, second, Every day at the dole out of gifts, Finn, son of Folkwald, would honour the Danes, bestow with an even hand to Hengest and Hengest's men the wrought gold rings, bounty to match the measure he gave his own Frisians, to keep morale in the beer hall high. Both sides then sealed their agreement. With oaths to Hengest, Finn swore openly, solemnly, that the battle survivors would be guaranteed honour and status. No infringement by word or deed, no provocation would be permitted. Their own ring-giver was dead and gone. They were leaderless, enforced allegiance to his murderer. A funeral pyre was then prepared, effulgent gold brought out from the hoard. The pride and prince of the shieldings lay awaiting the flame. Everywhere there were blood-plastered coats of mail. The pyre was heaped with boar-shaped helmets forged in gold, with the gashed corpses of well-born Danes. Many had fallen. Then Hildebur ordered her own son's body to be burnt with knafs, the flesh on his bones to sputter and blaze beside his uncles. The woman wailed and sang keens. The warrior went up. Carcass flame swirled and fumed. They stood round the burial mound and howled as heads melted. Crusted gashes spattered and ran bloody matter. The glutton element flamed and consumed the dead of both sides. Their great days were gone. Warriors scattered to homes and forts all over Friesland. Fewer now, feeling loss of friends. Hengist stayed, lived out that whole resentful, blood-sullen winter with Finn, homesick and helpless. No ring whirled prow could up then and away on the sea. Wind and water raged with storms. Wave and shingle were shackled in ice. Until another year appeared in the yard, as it does to this day, the seasons constant, the wonder of light coming over us. Then winter was gone. Earth's lap grew lovely. Longing woke in the cooped-up exile for a voyage home, but more for vengeance, some way of bringing things to a head. His sword arm hankered to greet the dutes. Thus blood was spilled, the gallant Finn slain in his home. The wildness in them had to brim over. The hall ran red with blood of enemies, 
Finn was cut down, the queen brought away, and everything the shieldings could find inside Finn's walls. The Frisian king's gold collars and gemstones swept off to the ship. Over sea lanes then, back to Daneland, the warrior troop bore that lady home. The poem was over. The poet had performed. A pleasant murmur started on the benches. Stewards did the rounds with wine and splendid jugs. The queen spoke to Hrothgar. Enjoy this drink, most generous lord. Raise up your goblet, entertain the geats duly and gently, discourse with them, be open-handed, happy and fond. Relish their company, but recollect as well all of the boons that have been bestowed on you. The bright court of Herod has been cleansed, and now the word is that you want to adopt this warrior as a son. So, while you may, bask in your fortune, and then bequeath kingdom and nation to your kith and kin. She turned then to the bench where her boys sat, all the youth together, and that good man, Beowulf the Geat, sat between the brothers. The cup was carried to him, kind words spoken in welcome, and a wealth of gold given to the hero. Two arm bangles, a mail shirt and rings, and the most resplendent torque of gold I ever heard tell of anywhere on earth or under heaven. Then the queen pronounced in the presence of the company, Take delight in this torque, dear Beowulf. Wear it for luck, and wear also this mail from our people's armory. May you prosper in them. Be acclaimed for strength, for kindly guidance to these two boys, and your bounty will be sure. You have won renown. You are known to all men, far and near, now and forever. Your sway is wide as the wind's home, as the sea around cliffs. And so, my prince, I wish you a lifetime's luck and blessings to enjoy this treasure. Treat my sons with tender care. Be strong and kind. Here each comrade is true to the other, loyal to Lord, loving in spirit. The thanes have one purpose. The people are ready. Having drunk and pledged, the ranks do as I bid. She moved then to her place. Men were drinking wine at that rare feast. How could they know fate, the grim shape of things to come, the threat looming over many thanes as night approached and King Hrothgar prepared to retire to his quarters? Retainers in great numbers were posted on guard as so often in the past. Benches were pushed back, bedding gear and bolsters spread across the floor and one man lay down to his rest, already marked for death. At their heads they placed their polished timber battle shields, and on the bench over them each man's kit was kept to hand, a towering war helmet, webbed mail shirt, and great shafted spear. It was their habit always and everywhere to be ready for action, at home or in the camp, in whatever case, and at whatever time the need arose to rally round their lord. They were a right people. They went to sleep, and one paid dearly for his night's ease, as it happened to them often, ever since Grendel occupied the gold hall, committing evil until the end came, death after his crimes. Then it became clear, obvious to everyone once the fight was over, that an avenger lurked and was still alive, grimly biding time. Grendel's mother, monstrous hell bride, brooded on her wrongs. She had been forced down into fearful waters, the cold depths, after Cain had killed his father's son, felled his own brother with a sword. Branded an outlaw, marked by having murdered, he moved into the wilds, shunned company and joy. 
and from Cain there sprang misbegotten spirits, among them Grendel, the banished and the cursed. But now his mother had sallied forth on a savage journey, grief-racked and ravenous, desperate for revenge. She came to Herod. There, inside the hall, Danes lay asleep, earls who would soon know a great reversal once Grendel's mother attacked and entered. Then in the hall, hard-honed blades were grabbed from the bench, many a broad shield lifted and braced. There was little thought of helmets or woven mail when they woke in terror. The hell dam was in panic, desperate to get out, in mortal terror the moment she was found. She had pounced and taken one of the retainers in a tight hold, then headed for the fen. To Hrothgar, this man was the most beloved of the friends he trusted between the two seas. She had done away with a great warrior, ambushed him at rest. Beowulf was elsewhere. Earlier, after the award of the treasure, the Geat had been given another lodging. There was uproar and Herod. She had snatched their trophy, Grendel's bloodied hand. It was a fresh blow to the afflicted bon. The bargain was hard, both parties having to pay with the lives of friends. And the old lord, the grey-haired warrior, was heart-sore and weary when he heard the news. His highest-placed adviser, his dearest companion, was dead and gone. Beowulf was quickly brought to the chamber. The winner of fights, the arch-warrior, came first footing in with his fellow troops to where the king in his wisdom waited, still wondering whether Almighty God would ever turn the tide of his misfortunes. So Beowulf entered with his band in attendance, and the wooden floorboards banged and rang as he advanced, hurrying to address the Prince of the Ingwinds asking if he'd rested, since the urgent summons had come as a surprise. Then Hrothgar, the shielding's helmet, spoke. Rest, what is rest? Sorrow has returned. Alas for the Danes. Eshery is dead. He was Irminlaf's elder brother and a soulmate to me, a true mentor, my right-hand man when the ranks clashed and our boar crests had to take a battering in the line of action. Ashery was everything the world admires in a wise man and a friend. Then this roaming killer came in a fury and slaughtered him in Herod. Where she is hiding, glutting on the corpse and glorying in her escape, I cannot tell. She has taken up the feud because of last night when you killed Grendel, wrestled and racked him in ruinous combat, since for too long he had terrorized us with his depredations. He died in battle, paid with his life, and now this powerful other one arrives, this force for evil driven to avenge her kinsman's death. I have heard it said by my people in Hall, counsellors who live in the upland country, that they have seen two such creatures prowling the moors, huge marauders from some other world. One of these things, as far as anyone can ever discern, looks like a woman. The other, warped in the shape of a man, moves beyond the pale bigger than any man, an unnatural birth called Grendel by the country people in former days. They are fatherless creatures, and their whole ancestry is hidden in a past of demons and ghosts. They dwell apart among wolves on the hills, on wind-swept crags and treacherous caches, where cold streams pour down the mountain and disappear under mist and moorland. A few miles from here, a frost-stiffened wood waits and keeps watch above a mere. The overhanging bank is a maze of tree roots mirrored in its surface. At night there, something uncanny happens. The water burns, and the mere bottom has never been sounded by the sons of men. 
On its bank, the heather stepper halts. The heart in flight from pursuing hounds will turn to face them with firm-set horns and die in the wood rather than dive beneath its surface. That is no good place. When wind blows up and stormy weather makes clouds scud and the skies weep, out of its depths a dirty surge is pitched towards the heavens. Now help depends again on you and on you alone. The gap of danger where the demon waits is still unknown to you. Seek it if you dare. I will compensate you for settling the feud as I did the last time with lavish wealth, coffers of coiled gold if you come back. Beowulf, the son of Edgetheo, spoke. Why, sir, do not grieve. It is always better to avenge dear ones than to indulge in mourning. For every one of us, living in this world means waiting for our end. Let whoever can win glory before death. When a warrior is gone, that will be his best and only bulwark. So arise, my lord and let us immediately set forth on the trail of this troll dam. I guarantee you, she will not get away, not to dens underground, nor upland groves, nor the ocean floor. She'll have nowhere to flee to. Endure your troubles today. Bear up, and be the man I expect you to be. With that, the old lord sprang to his feet, and praise God for Beowulf's pledge. Then a bit and halter were brought for his horse with the plaited mane. The wise king mounted the royal saddle and rode out in style with a force of shield-bearers. The forest paths were marked all over with the monster's tracks, her trail on the ground wherever she had gone across the dark moors, dragging away the body of that thane. Hrothgar's best counsellor and overseer of the country. So the noble prince proceeded undismayed, up fells and screes, along narrow footpaths and ways where they were forced into single file, ledges on cliffs above lairs of water monsters. He went in front with a few men, good judges of the lie of the land, and suddenly discovered the dismal wood mountain trees growing out at an angle above grey stones. The bloodshot water surged underneath. It was a sore blow to all of the Danes, friends of the Shieldings, a hurt to each and every one of that noble company when they came upon Asheri's head at the foot of the cliff. Everybody gazed as the hot gore kept wallowing up and an urgent war horn repeated its notes. The whole party sat down to watch. The water was infested with all kinds of reptiles. There were writhing sea dragons and monsters slouching on slopes by the cliff, serpents and wild things such as those that often surface at dawn to roam the sail road and doom the voyage. Down they plunged, lashing in anger at the loud call of the battle bugle. An arrow from the bow of the Geat chief got one of them as he surged to the surface. The seasoned shaft went in deep, and his freedom in the water got less and less. It was his last swim. He was swiftly overwhelmed in the shallows, prodded by barbed boar spears, cornered, beaten, pulled up on the bank, a strange lake berth a loathsome catch men gazed at in awe. Beowulf got ready, donned his war gear indifferent to death. His mighty hand-forged fine-webbed mail would soon meet with the menace underwater. It would keep the bone cage of his body safe. No enemy's clasp could crush him in it, no vicious arm lock choke his life out. To guard his head he had a glittering helmet 
that was due to be muddied on the mere bottom and blurred in the upswirl. It was of beaten gold, princely headgear, hooped and hasped by a weaponsmith who had worked wonders in days gone by and embellished it with boar shapes. Since then it had resisted every sword. And another item lent by Unferth at that moment was of no small importance. The Brehon handed him a hilted weapon, a rare and ancient sword named Hrunting. The iron blade with its ill-boding patterns had been tempered in blood. It had never failed the hand of anyone who hefted it in battle, anyone who had fought and faced the worst in the gap of danger. This was not the first time it had been called to perform heroic feats. Beowulf, son of Edgtheo, spoke. Wisest of kings, now that I have come to the point of action, I ask you to recall what we said earlier, that you, son of Halfdane and gold friend to retainers, that you, if I should fall and suffer death while serving in your cause, would act like a father to me afterwards. If this combat kills me, take care of my young company, my comrades in arms. And be sure also, my beloved Hrothgar, to send Hialak the treasures I received. Let the Lord of the Geats gaze on that gold. Let Hrethel's son take note of it and see that I found a ring-giver of rare magnificence and enjoyed the good of his generosity. And Unferth is to have what I inherited. To that far-famed man I bequeath my own sharp-honed, wave-sheened wonder-blade. With hunting I shall gain glory or die.' 